Hey guys, and welcome to another special episode of Costa Rica Crypto, where today I have the honor and the pleasure of speaking to one of my favorite BPs, um, the man, one of the men behind the BP, Mr. Kevin Rose. Welcome, Kevin. I appreciate you coming out, and I'm really, really excited to have the opportunity to speak to you today. Thanks for having me, and I hope you can't, uh, you can't hear the notifications going on in the background, right? Because they, they don't stop. <laughs> they never stop. It's one of the one of the joys of, of being in the EOS game. I guess uh, before we kind of get going, I, I wanted to just start with a little bit of a warm up question. I guess kind of like tell us a little bit about where you grew up, how you came to find EOS, and kind of that defining moment where you knew you wanted to be involved. And then maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do for fun when you're not working. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and you know, we, you always want to be as transparent as possible, but then you don't want to give away the. Um, the the secret questions to your password reset right where like where was the where were you born and where was high school but anyway so uh, I can still share some of it uh, I grew up in in New England in um, in the United States and I pretty much lived in Connecticut uh, New York New Jersey Pennsylvania throughout my entire life uh, I started to get into blockchain <clears throat> the beginning of last year when my co-founder Rick Schlesinger I mean, imagine just the proverbial, like, grab you by the collar and just smack you in the face. Like, you need to pay attention to what is going on here because you are going to miss this. Uh, and he was absolutely right. So I started to just research everything I could. Uh, at the time, I was working a job that required a lot of driving. So I must have listened to 100 hours of people just talking about blockchain and the idea and the technology um, <clears throat> and its current challenges because that was that was the that's still a big thing is there's this cool idea but what can we actually do with it so then i um we found the eos white paper in july uh when it was released and rick read it rick schlesinger the co-founder and he he gave it to me he's like here you go this is it uh, i read it a dozen times and and i said this is something that they're trying to make that can be usable and I know that that's a word when people outside of blockchain laugh. They're like, well, oh, good. It's going to be usable. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a big deal at the stage that we're in. Uh, and we started to really think through the challenges and the problems and the launch and uh, what EOS could do and read more about Dan Larimer. And this idea of a block producer was something that we were drawn to and we we started to, so my background is in marketing communications and I worked for, you know, this is one of the companies of, and many Cooper and BMW and uh, Toyota, Ford, et cetera. And, and uh, so I, I know what it takes in terms of manpower and money to run uh, an, uh, an international marketing campaign. And so this idea of a block producer, uh, I was like, this is going to be a monumental lift that they need to communicate in multiple languages to people where they don't know where they are, where they have no feedback loop, and they're not going to be able to hear back from them, uh, except for those who choose to communicate back. And when there were none that were around, we looked around, we're like, where are these block producers? We said, okay, we well, you know, we're just going to do it ourselves. So it was, um, it was in the recovery room of after my daughter was born that I got on the phone call, a phone call with Rick, and we decided to do this. And we have been working on it since last uh, August. Uh, we announced ourselves in January. We're the first block producer candidate in the Western world. We later learned, we thought we were the first, period, and we learned that EOS Gravity had been doing work in, in China since you know October or before. Um, and the rest is history. We just haven't looked back since. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been cool. You've kind of been a dominant force and we've received a lot of communication from you guys, which of course the community appreciates. And, um, and I know you guys are working on some big things that we're going to talk about here in the near future. But before we head down that road, um, I really have a personal belief that EOS has the capacity to affect change in the world. And I'm willing to bet that if you're so involved in this project, you probably believe the same thing. Um, in what way do you see that unfolding or in what way you see maybe EOS being able to impact the lives of, of regular people? Yeah, I, I th 
just taking a step back and thinking about blockchain in general is I think that um, it's not as disruptive as we think. I think it's, I think blockchain is a foundational technology. And that was something that Brendan Bloomer said also in an interview um, earlier this year that it's not, uh, you know, Bitcoin was the discovery of the light bulb and blockchain is the harnessing of electricity. So they're two very different things. Uh, and that's what I mean by fundamental, in that everything will be affected by it given enough time. So for EOS specifically, what it's capable of doing is at the very least, at the very soonest, is building decentralized applications that put the value creator at the center of the conversation. And for, for all of what we imagine EOS uh, to be able to do and blockchain to be able to do, it's going to, take a, it's going to take a long time because the ideas behind blockchain of um, alignment of incentives and management of a common pool resource on mass and um, equitable opportunity f- you know, for everybody involved, these are these are like paradigm shifts, dare I say, such a um, tropish phrase. Uh, but it's going to take a generation for that to to take hold. Um, but but first and foremost, it's EOS's ability to build usable decentralized applications that can put the value creator at the center of the conversation. Yeah, I think that's a really good answer, and I have to agree. I I also really like the way that. Um, seeing a lot of dApps kind of develop that are having some pretty interesting, like, um, you know, social uses and, and social impact too. And some of these are kind of coming to the the front, which I really like. And, I've, you know, it's just been a neat little journey. I guess we kind of talked briefly about how your background is in marketing. Um, of course, I creeped your, le- your LinkedIn, as I always do. I like to do a little bit of research before we start. And I can see that, you, you know, you've kind of, as you said, you've kind of built your name. How important is are those skills and how transferable are those skills that you've learned to your day-to-day work with the community? You find it's a, it's been kind of a beneficial transition. Well, I think, you know, a block producer is an elected entity and to be elected, you need to convince someone to elect you and to convince someone to do anything. You need to be able to effectively communicate to them. So I think it's a basic thing that all block producers should be able to do beyond that EOS is complex it's cutting edge. It's a new technology, and uh, you the the block producer, or I, I think an effective block producer, which right now is the the best positioned group to evangelize um, uh, EOS right now, should be able to take these very complex topics and make them concise and digestible. So I think that those are very key skills, not just well as a block producer, but just in in life, being able to communicate. Because we're all just people trying to make our way. But the, uh, the, the, the marketing aspect, marketing is such a dirty word, advertising. And um, there are definitely bad ways to do it. Uh, and I, I just like telling valuable stories and I like telling truths. Uh, and why I was so drawn to this besides just being a curious enthusiast and seeing the power of what blockchain can do for the future um, is because this was all a story worth telling. Uh, I can't go back to what I used to do, uh, which which was automotive. Uh, I, I can't go back to that. So so I think I think it's very important um, to be able to communicate, and I'm very happy that I have a story worth telling. But uh, but beyond that, I have had an absolute blast learning about entirely new subjects. Um, one of the things that I'd love to talk about at some point is, you know, just the dispute resolution, uh, architecting a dispute resolution framework and the importance of that to transactional confidence and contract enforcement. That has nothing to do with marketing, but that's what I've been doing, you know, every waking minute for the last two months is trying to, to learn about that and then test what I've learned against people who are actually lawyers <laughs> and see how many holes they can poke. Um, but so it's, it's a good skill to have. I think it's good for block producers to have it. And uh, I'm just so happy that I can use what I know how to do here. We're definitely going to lead into that a little bit more. I think um, we're going to talk about that. I've, I've been through your medium and um, <coughs> written really, really well. I really enjoy it. 
I really enjoy everything that you're posting there. We will get to those. I just want to ask you kind of a few preliminary questions that kind of lead up on one of the questions, one of the points you just brought up. Um, there's a being a BP is a highly political, you know, driven task. Of course, that's the nature, as you just said. Um, is there what are kind of some of the difficulties you face on navigating that that political map, the political landscape, or is there any part that um, maybe you don't enjoy or you wish you could change? Uh, you know, what's been really great about the entire thing is that while it may seem extremely political, it's not in the traditional sense in that you're trying to um, navigate a lot of self-interest because <clears throat> right now I would say that the majority of block producers and people who are in positions of influence are all trying to push ideas that are they think are best for the network, not necessarily best for themselves. So it's 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 been more of a like a meritocracy of ideas. Um, I've enjoyed that aspect of it, but there's certainly been a lot to learn. Um, not not about politics, but about culture. Uh, I've never had to operate on such a global sk stage, and I've learned that sometimes what you may mean <clears throat> isn't obviously what is received and there is a there is a, a cultural film between uh everybody and so i i'm learning i'm learning the things that sort of make me american uh when it comes to how i'm perceived the way that i act the way that i talk the way that i propose things um and what it means to be viewed as an American at, for someone that's outside this country. So I'm trying very actively to be more aware of, of how, uh, uh, more aware of the cultural differences so that there it's, it's easier to collaborate uh, rather than have those cultural differences become obstacles. Yeah, I think that's cool. What I'm hearing you say is, first of all, that you're finding that people involved in the BPs have more of an altruistic, uh, for the most part, an altruistic kind of approach to some of the democratic decisions, which is a beautiful thing to hear because it means people really care about the system. And I can imagine, I know what you're saying, it's, it's definitely different on a global scale when uh, you have to learn a lot about uh, new cultures and of course a lot of those cultures, some of the habits that we take for granted or some of the regular things that we take for granted um, might be a little bit different in those. So that's a yeah. another game changer. I understand. And, and going back to um, some of the block producers being altruistic, I think that, and maybe it's just because, you know, we're, we're living it now, but it may be the, the golden age of that because many of the block producers and standby producers have been here before launch and they came here to make this thing work not because of any financial opportunity but because this was something worth doing that's who is populating the system right now that's what's amazing about it um and it's because, I mean, some people have been working for six months for, for, for free. Some people are working right now for free or for very little. Um, and, and I hope that we can have people like that, uh, not people willing to work for free, but people who truly care about what it is that we're doing here uh, for as long as we possibly can. But there, there may come a time where EOS gets to the point of critical mass where uh, it's more of an op uh, a financial opportunity than it is an opportunity to impact change, which hopefully what we've done when that happens is mature the system to the point where those two things are indistinguishable from one another. From one another. So I, you, it, it doesn't, my actions are such that it doesn't matter what my motivations are, whether it be to make money or to make the world a better place, because the, the end result is EOS is better for it. That's what I think we need to focus on right now is architecting this system to make the incentives that we have powerful enough and aligned in a way that we can sustain a shift in the, the motivations of the participants in the future. Yeah, that's that's fair, and I think that that's a really beautiful thing. And I hope that much as much as kind of you're saying that 
EPs are recognizing this opportunity and, and looking to build a, a legacy that will, that will last for a lot of years. Um, and hopefully a lot of people see that. I, I think that they do. And I think that you're right when you say the people who are involved right now care. I've, I've had the, the pleasure of speaking to a lot of them. And I noticed um, like these people, much like yourself, and much like myself, live, breathe, eat, sleep, EOS. And it's a beautiful thing. And, and as you're saying, we'll get into it a little bit more, but hopefully we can keep financial incentives um, aligned in such a way um, that the infrastructure is already set up and everything's already rolling smooth by the time that happens. Great. Um, okay, so a few questions. We're going to speak about a little bit about financials. We're going to speak a little bit about financial transparency. I know that that you recently posted something on Medium, a little bit about that. How important is financial transparency for being a VP? And what are some of the things that you're working on right now to be able to walk that walk, so to speak? Well, I think for being... <clears throat> For being a block producer, we, we spent a lot of time before we announced ourselves in January thinking through what it meant to be a block producer and, and what what we're about as people and what our block producer is about, um, morals, mission, compass, things like that. But when it comes to things of like financial transparency, um, these things are, all, are only as important to a block producer as they are important to the token holder. And I think that... Uh, they're very, you can't hear my daughter crying in the background, can you? <laughs> no, but this, okay. it's all good. Okay. Uh, she's had a rough day. She's got like four teeth coming in. Um, so it's, it, financial transparency is very important right now because <clears throat> we're, what we're doing is we're, we're, block producers are paid through inflation. You have the 1% of total tokens issued that are paid to block producers via block pay and vote pay um, every single day. And uh, what what is important to the token holders is that um, beyond a reasonable, uh, you know, beyond paying yourself, are, are you taking what you earn? Uh, are you reinvesting it into your, your, uh, capital infrastructure, your ser your servers at the most basic level. Um, we we have we actually have a block reward priority framework which we share um, in our Telegram channel. Uh, so it's people just need to know what you're doing is reinvesting back in the network. So our priorities are basically to start with it's your operating network infrastructure and capital expenses. It's it's running the business and and producing blocks. Um, after that, we're putting time and money toward building developer and community tools. So that's uh, EOS Stats, that's EOS Docs uh, that we built, that's uh, EOS Resource Planner, which we think is going to be huge on EOS. Uh, you know, how much does it cost to develop? That's a big question. We're actually going to release some updates on that um, very soon. We're building the hardware wallet, um, which uh, we're testing a prototype, which is working right now. It's great. Uh, and then after that, it's you know community engagement, growth, uh, and developer education. Uh, and then we want to provide services directly to DApps with uh, whether it be advisory or staking resources um, so that they can operate. But it's important to token holders that block producers are doing these things uh, because right now – more than ever, it's important that we are we are growing as rapidly as possible. We should be a rocket ship, um, and for that reason, you know, it, we have this worker proposal system, which is being debated about whether or not it should even exist. And and it's and you know because it's too big of a honeypot or whatever the reason. But oh man, I I wish that we could get into that and get that money. And, you know, I want to write a worker proposal that takes $5 million and puts it to developer education all around the world. How to develop on EOS. Free class. Show up. We'll build a Hello World app. You'll, we'll give you these tools. Go do it. Build your dApp. Um, achieve your dream, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, going back to your question, it's important to token holders that – it's not important to block producers. It's important to token holders that uh, block producers are transparent with their financials because they need to know that their tokens are the token values being taken care of. Not that there's any fiduciary duty there on behalf of block producers, but let's be real. That's part of the reason that's part of their criteria for voting. Uh, so we want to be tra as transparent as possible. And in Q1 of, of next year, we will have something that resembles a public earnings call where we can have 500 people on, on a conference call and we will review what we've accomplished and how much it costs to accomplish it. Uh, it, it'll be basically be a public earnings call without financial advice. 
for sure. Here's what I'm hearing. Um, your your main goal is to make sure that your that yourself and others are being held accountable to take the money, reinvest it, and make sure that the infrastructure is tight. Um, and then make sure that the money is going back into resources that are ultimately going to boost EOS higher. I get it. I think that that's a noble way to go about it. And I appreciate it. We're going to get into the hardware wallet because I love it. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit more about the worker proposal system. But yeah, I jump around. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's cool, man. No, it's it's awesome. Like the, the beautiful thing about doing a, you know, about kind of talking to me is that it's all it's all casual. It's all fun, and that's kind of how it's intended to be. So no stress. But I, I want to ask you kind of one last little kicker question before we move on. In five years' time, everything is perfect or near perfect because um, that sometimes can be a bad word. Where, where are you? What are you doing? What's life like? Oh, where am I? Yeah. What are, what's going on in, in the world of Kevin Rose in five years if everything is beautiful? I hope that I'm still here. <laughs> okay. I, I hope that I am still involved in EOS. I hope that I hope that I've been able to help build this into something strong. And I hope that I don't have to divert my attention. I hope that I'm able to do that so that I can continue to be, to be paid to be here so I don't have to find another job and, and, and take care of my family that way. I just hope I can still be here. I love it, man. That's, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the humility. And I can see, like, I can see it in your eyes. You're kind of staring off into the distance. Like, I can see the realness there. Um, I'm not very good at much, but I'm good at reading people, and I can get that you're into it. And, that you <laughs> and really, that's, um, you know, that's a that's the primary criteria you guys are doing a hell of a job so appreciate that uh, i want to talk about something that's got me really interested you kind of touched on it hardware wallet what's going yeah. on with the hardware wallet let's talk about it all right code name the bridge project code name the bridge um it's actually there there there's more to the hardware wallet that we're building than meets the eye so first i think that we we are targeting a, a specific uh niche which I, I hope we're doing it correctly, but Block One's building a hardware wallet. It's going to be expensive. Ledger is one hundred forty dollars. That is also expensive. Um, when it, when I, if you're looking at a, a global stage, we're trying to get this thing to be forty bucks or less, and it is EOS only. So one of the things that we want to do is there, there's this typical learning curve. I went through it. You might have gone through it. When you get into this space, it's, it's, I heard of Bitcoin. Then I heard of blockchain. Then I heard of Ethereum. Then I can go any number of ways. So we, we want to start to, um, we want to make EOS plug and play. And we want to short circuit that learning curve. And this is just a small detail of that. But this, that's, that's you know, our, also to make it uh, affordable. Um, is why it's EOS exclusive. So it's, it will not work for another currency. Um, but hopefully it is, uh, it is worth it for you to have it because, um, you know, you, you have found EOS attractive enough and, and you're taking security serious enough that, that, that that's something you need. Um, but we have a prototype. It is built. We're currently uh, designing the, the product, which is a fun part for me. Uh, like doing that this week and next week. Um, and we hope to share some things about it soon. But, I, but here's the fun part. The most exciting thing about the hardware wallet that we're building doesn't have much to do with the hardware wallet. I'll just leave it at that. I like it. I like it. That'll give us something to think about in the next little while. And I look forward to, uh, I look forward to seeing that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post links to everything we're talking about below the video, like your link to the hardware wallet, um, of course, the link to the website and all that kind of stuff too. So cool. if anyone else wants to find out more, you've done some really, really well-written and lengthy medium posts on that. Um, but I want to pay forward into something a little bit more technical. Let's talk about the worker proposal system and kind of what your thoughts are on it. Um, you recently, you recently kind of wrote a proposal that talked about arbitration and ECAF, um, as well as another one on the worker proposal system. Let's dig in a little bit and, um, and see Oof. what your thoughts are and where you're heading with those. Okay. Let's unpack that. <laughs> um, so the, the worker proposal fund is a very 
cool thing. And it's the concept of it that, I mean, you know, it, it, imagine if a government were funded solely from the fixed, transparent, and inflation rate of, their, of the monetary system. So imagine that the 5% of EOS, EOS is a, take EOS and put it in the United States and say, <clears throat> the 5% here is your budget now, government. There you go. Uh, and that's, and, and it's being used, you know, as efficiently and leanly as possible to grow whatever it needs to the infrastructure of the United States and, and you know, NASA and things that don't need to necessarily be monetized but that are very helpful to improve the public good. The worker proposal system in EOS is a way to not be hindered by the fact that we are so decentralized. Not everything needs to be decentralized. Um, and what we can do with it is expect for that fund to be voted on and pay for the things that which no individual could do or be expected to do for the network themselves. So I think that in theory, it's a great thing. In application in EOS, it is, it is very prone to abuse. It is a honeypot. It, is a half, it could be a half a billion dollars in one year. I don't think we could spend that money if we tried. There are very important things that we need to accelerate. Um, that is dispute resolution on EOS. Not necessarily ECAF, but dispute resolution on EOS. That is uh, a, a system of developer training. That is uh, prop, uh, uh, hiring, a, hiring a myriad of security firms to run tests on the code, to run tests on the block producers, to just be nonstop making sure that what we are operating is the safest infrastructure and code base that it could possibly could be. These are things that you can't come to EOS New York and say, please pay for block producer pen testing for EOS Rio. I'm not going to pay for that. And they're not going to pay for it for me. But if you, if you could draw from the work proposal fund and say, we're going to pay for this for everybody, and we've all voted on it, we all consent to it, um, that's a cool thing. So one of the things that we propose is that, <clears throat> first of all, burn all the tokens. All right, we don't, we don't need a slush fund sitting there. Uh, maybe a small fund for emergencies. I can understand that. We don't need half a billion dollars. Uh, it is a honeypot. So rather than that, um, we we should have this governance layer over it and this governance layer of people who are responsible for reviewing proposals, whether it be, um, excuse me, through software and automation or through manual reviews, uh, they, should be in, they should be held accountable to the token holders. I don't know specifically how or what's technically feasible, but they should be held accountable. Uh, and the tokens should be issued when a proposal is approved. That's, it, the, the worker proposal fund isn't this static thing. It doesn't need to be 4% or, or no percent. It's like, it's whatever we make it. We can change this number. We can turn it on, we can turn it off. We can fund things as they come. So that's one of the things that we're, we're advocating. There are certainly use cases for the worker proposal fund. Uh, to accelerate the development of the EOS ecosystem. The, the, the thing that we need to remember is that we need to do so in a way that provides uh, governance to the funds so that ultimately whoever is responsible is accountable to the token holder. Yeah, that makes sense. I get it and I tend to agree. And that's kind of a, until we chatted the other day and I actually took a look at that, took a look at your Medium post, I really thought about it as something that you can kind of turn on turn off and it's a logical approach i like it and they actually the the, the worker proposal uh, group um who are people that i know personally and um uh, but 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 i shouldn't have to know them 
to trust them. Uh, that's the one thing I think is very important because uh, you cannot expect or request to the average token holder, hey, you're going to need to personally vet all of these people that are involved in making these decisions. That is not what a trustless decentralized network is about. So that's what I mean by having the worker proposal system reviewers um, accountable to the token holders. But today, this morning, 6.30, 6 a.m., uh, I woke up and immediately started reading their first round of emergency budget uh, proposals. So that is basically their own system. So the development of the worker proposal system, the portal, uh, and all the dev work behind it. The the committee itself, because nobody should spend their time working for free. I mean, the people providing value should be paid for the value they provide, period. Uh, and then, oddly enough, in the same, on the same page, uh, they also included a proposal to fund ECAF, and they included a proposal to fund the management and testing of the code that goes into the EOS mainnet repo. Uh, upon further investigation, it, it was what I thought, which is those, those four proposals are separate. The creation of the emergency um, committee and the work proposal portal, that funding is, is uh, something they sponsor, obviously. It is their proposal. But the EOS mainnet uh, GitHub repo and the funding for ECAF, they, they, they are not sponsoring, they, are, they did not write, and they are not, you know, I get not sponsored. They're also not endorsing it, you know. So uh, it's good that they have since made that distinction. Uh, and I think that's important for everybody to know. And, and I'm looking for a way that, okay, you're, you're having these emergency proposals now, the most important thing we should do right now is not talk about, in my opinion, the GitHub repo management, uh, which is important, or the funding of ECAF, which also is important. But the actual worker proposal system itself, the development of a proper UX UI where you can go in, sign in with Scatter or whatever way that you're going to import your private key and confirm your identity and vote on a proposal. And then the back end work that actually checks for how many votes are there, should this funding uh, be issued, what's the governance layer, all that. That's the most important thing. We can't talk about the work proposal fund funding things until the work proposal fund itself has been approved. It's, you know, chicken <laughs> yeah. out of the egg type thing. Yeah, you can't, uh, can't put the wheel before the cart. I mean, you're right. right. <laughs> it makes sense to me. Of course, we need somewhere, portal where people can log in and, um, and something, all the stuff can be administered. Uh, I also read another media, Medium article about, um, you said that it's, Online, on-chain arbitration has yet to be done, and I think that you believe that EOS can do it. Uh, do you want to talk about kind of the article you wrote and some yeah. of the proposals involved therein? Yes. So this has to do with the, um, the recognition of authority and the enforceability of contracts. So you and I have an agreement. This agreement is to build me a DAP. This agreement involves cash. It involves EOS. So basically, we have on-chain property. We have off-chain property. In our contract that we write with each other, there's an arbitration clause. For anything to be arbit arbitrable or to be able to be arbitrated, you must have a valid arbitration clause in any of the 158 countries that signed the New York Convention of 1959. And basically, what that means is you need to say, uh, the scope in your agreement of what is arbitrable. So the entire agreement is arbitrable, let's say, that's for example. And then you need to define the jurisdiction and the rules for dispute resolution and under which you would arbitrate. So let's say for you and I, in this cash EOS hybrid deal for you to build the DAP for me, we have a contract that we write, it's off chain, and we specify the American Arbitration Association. Okay. We have a problem. Uh, I, I can't remember who was building the DAP in this example. Let's say it was me. I, because I'm sure you build a great DAP. But I, I'm, a, I'm a crappy dev. And I built a crappy product. And I took, I took your money and I took your EOS. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> you want to get it back. We arbitrate. And uh, I lose. And I say, I'm not going to pay you. You can go to the court, and the court, uh, the local court in the United States, because they're um, a, a signatory of the New York Convention, which is the honoring of, of 
uh, of foreign arbitral awards. By the way, assume we're in different countries for this. Uh, the, the court will enforce the ruling without even looking at the evidence. They don't care. The, you, you, you've empowered an arbitrator to decide on your case. So that, that's it. They will basically check to see, is there a problem with the arbitrator or is there a problem with, did, did somehow the ruling or the award break local law? If not, valid, enforced. Uh, so then I have to give you the cash back. And you could do that by going to my bank. The, the government can tell the bank to send the money. Okay, great. Now comes the EOS property. Who are you going to go to to enforce that? Are you going to go to the, to the blockchain? Are you going to go to block producers? Who, who, the, who, who are you, who are you to the block producers? Okay. I'm going to get, so as a block producer, I'm going to get an email that says like, Hey, here's an arbitral award from the American arbitration association or the international center for dispute resolution. I don't care. I, I'm not all of a sudden going to honor foreign arbitral awards as a block producer. We are a different jurisdiction. We are no jurisdiction. We are a distributed jurisdiction. So what this proposal was about is to create a method for arbitration associations and arbitrators to register themselves with the blockchain so that there is a method to recognize their authority. But beyond that, there also needs to be a layer of legal language in our constitution, terms of service, whatever you want to call it, um, that, that says arbitration is the preferred method of dispute resolution. And for you to arbitrate anything on chain, you must include on chain your contract. And within that contract, the specific reg forum, which is the account ID of the arbitration forum, and the reg arbitrator, well, not necessarily in a contract because you may not know your arbitrator yet. That's just a little detail. But if you were to choose an arbitrator directly instead of a, uh, an association, you would include their name. So now you have a contract on chain with an arbitration clause that, rec that is with an arbitrator or arbitration forum that has registered themselves on chain. We have within the constitution language that says we all agree to arbitration uh, that is binding in your contracts between you and another person. So now this can be brought to a block producer as a last line of enforcement. It's not something that we want to happen all the time. We, we prefer people just enforce things themselves, but when people are in a dispute, they don't really agree on stuff. So you have to be able to find a way to enforce it. So basically, it's just that. It's, it's, a, it's enforcing arbitral awards. And what that does is provide enforcement to the contract. And what that does is provide co uh, transactional confidence. It's, it's a facet of... Uh, of me being confident not only in the immutability of the blockchain and that my transaction of EOS to, from point A to point B will be processed and cannot be reversed, and it cannot be reversed. Even if the block producers can't reverse anything, they would just, you could, you could do something that would reverse the effect, but you can't actually reverse or erase the transaction. But it increases transactional confidence. So just to recap, it is a method to identify uh, arbitration associations and arbitrators on chain so that the last line of enforcement block producers can enforce the arbitral awards so that contracts can be enforced and we can have transactional confidences for businesses to conduct their business on chain. So in idiot speak, which I'm particularly um, good at, you're, what you're saying is ultimately you want a system that makes people um, know that you can be held accountable if you're not playing by the rules of the agreed upon contract and something that that's actually going to execute it by doing so you're giving business uh, more confidence in the ability to use blockchain use the system and ultimately a bridge towards more adoption so I think that that's yeah great. but it goes it goes deeper than that because we we also have to think about um, what do we do when there is a dispute with a smart contract let's say that smart contract has executed now what? What if there's a dispute after the, the, the funds have been moved? For you to, without a strong identity layer, if you and I have an agreement and I have, I have divested or, or liquidated the assets that I have received, uh, your, your SOL. Yeah. So there is, 
ECAF has not demonstrated that they have the ability, nor has anyone demonstrated to me, that there is a process for recovering funds that have been stolen. There are what they what ECAF has done so far is demonstrate they have the ability to prevent theft or the execution of fraudulent transactions on the blockchain in general. So there are actually people that we are that EOS New York is talking with that have written software development kits or code that you could basically copy and paste within a smart contract and have any um, executable transaction issue uh, a notification to you prior to execution. So basically a delay on the transaction and a notification to you where then you can say, I'm going to check the criteria which allow for this transaction to take place to make sure nothing's fishy. And if it, excuse me, if it is, I will freeze that contract and I will enter a dispute mode. And the only person that can freeze the contract are the people in the contract. Uh, and then once you're in that dispute mode, you go and arbitrate that dispute. And still at the end of the day, um, we need to have this, this last line of enforcement of, of block producers with arbitral awards. And they need a way to recognize the authority of essentially foreign arbitrators or things outside of the EOS jurisdiction, which is any arbitration forum uh, you know, in, in, in the world. For sure. I appreciate the fact that you're taking an active role in that and that that's something you're passionate about because I think ultimately it's going to benefit the ecosystem. So I want to thank you for that. You kind of mentioned briefly um, other environments. I know you recently set up a new community manager in China. You went down there and had kind of, uh, you spent a little bit of time with him. How important is it to engage the engage some of the Asian markets and do you have any futures, any future plans either, you know, kind of with those markets or with your community managers in other jurisdictions? Yeah, it's incredibly important. Um, a block producer needs to be a global entity. We're EOS New York, but we're, we want to be a global block producer. And uh, Da Hong is, is great. He is a coder. He is a trader. Uh, and he is an EOS community manager. You really can do it all. And we have, we've, when we announced that, we finalized, uh, you know, he, he's with us full time. And, uh, you know, one of the most valuable things for me is, you know, I call up Da Hong, we get on Skype and, and I go, what's going on? What matters right now, today and tomorrow and or yesterday? Uh, and, and, and that's great to talk about because what we want to be able to do is we, we don't want to, we don't want to operate in a hemispheric echo chamber. We want to be able to understand what's going on overseas. There are a massive amount of tokens over there, which means that there's a massive amount of importance. The stakeholders of the network are distributed across the world and they are densely distributed across, across China. Beyond, beyond China, a, um, a very high priority for us is to understand more of the EOS community in, in South Korea. Um, funds willing. Uh, the token price going to $4.50 got everybody scared. So we sort of paused some stuff for a little bit. We're like, let's see how this goes um, before we uh, tell some people that we're going to pay them full time. Uh, but that's, that's kind of our, our priority. And, and uh, there are a lot of groups out there that are doing a great job at uh, connecting um, the Eastern and Western cultures, particularly uh, Eve La Rose from EOS Nation, uh, Da Fong from EOS Asia, and uh, Marshall Long from, um, uh, from EOS Fish. They formed the link, which is a very cool thing uh, to connect the, the Eastern and Western cultures. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to learning more and uh, opening our eyes to, to the global community that is EOS. I think it's important. I think if you're not doing that, um, they're missing the mark. But I can see that you guys right. are really putting a, a good effort towards doing that, and I respect that. I want to ask you really quickly about something that came up. And, of course, I, like, I love the dApps. Uh, that's kind of, you know, like I, I love the EOS. I love the governance and that kind of thing. But um, I'm really interested in some of the new projects that are being built. You mentioned that you guys might have kind of a maybe a dApp support, maybe like incubation type mm -hmm. thing near future is that something that you're working on now what's your progress with that and what are some of the future plans so we're not a, a massive team uh, there are some block producer teams that have a hundred people 
which is insane. I don't, it doesn't compute in my head. But we're, we're not a massive team, we're not a VC. So we don't wanna act like a VC. But we do have a diverse background in technology, communications, and business. Uh, the three heads of, of EOS New York is uh, myself in marketing communications. Uh, for at one point in my life, building pitch decks was my job. Um, Rick Schlesinger, who did a, almost a decade in mergers and acquisitions and business consulting, management consulting, uh, he could build a deck better than I can. And then um, uh, Buddy Deck has been deploying uh, data centers and, and working distributed computing for just as long as all of us have been doing all of our jobs. So with those three powers combined, we're Captain Dat Planet and we want to help um, advise uh, DAPs on like, how does, how does their token economy look? How is the, what's the feasibility and go-to-market strategy of their idea? How does their pitch deck look? Um, okay, from there, are there connections that we can help make for this group? Because we ourselves are starting to get connected with people who are VCs professionally. And we would much rather do these great ideas of service by connecting them to people who are, who are VCs professionally than trying to act like VCs ourselves. Um, but we do also have access to resources. And for those um, projects that, that require it and we think are, is, a, is a good use of our resources, we will stake resources for them. We're about to stake uh, a whole lot of resources for Shintai, the token leasing platform that EOS42 has spearheaded, which is going to be pretty dope. Uh, we'll just say that. So uh, yeah, so you can email us at daps at eosnewyork.io uh, and uh, we have been, kind of inundated, which is how I imagine block one felt when they said, Hey, we have a billion dollars. Like <laughs> send us an email. I bet they got a lot. Uh, we've gotten a lot. So we're slowly going through them because we want to meticulously go through these ideas. We're actively working with three. Um, and one of them, we can't wait to announce. They're kind of in like stealth mode. They're talking with one of those VCs that we have introduced them to. We hope it's successful. Um, but there are some dApps that are coming that we know about, and I'm sure there are many, many more that we don't, but the ones that we know about are pretty damn cool. Uh, and, and we're happy to be a small part of, of making them come to life. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I, uh, I've been, I've been, I've done a couple of videos on Chintai and I've been like chasing David, but he's so busy. He's kind of, we've got it all worked out. Yeah, couple, good luck with that. <laughs> I know I gotta, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to nail him down, but I, I, I love Chintai. Um, and of course, you know, there's, there's some dApps that I'm involved with on a, on a small level. And it's just what's coming out and what's happening is, is cool. And, um, and I think that you have kind of everything covered. Like, you know, you understand the importance of, having good infrastructure for yourself. You're working on building the infrastructure for EOS.io in between arbitration and, um, and that kind of thing as well. You know, good with communications around the world. And, and um, you know, obviously you're, you're engaged with the community and you're working, on, you're working with some people on dApps. So it's good to see and I think that it's a well-rounded approach to, to doing what we, you know, what ultimately the job entails. Uh, it's not a job. This is, this, <laughs> this is a... This is a purpose, man. It's, uh, it, I, I learned about a concept in, in Japanese that is called Ikigai, which is the um, something you're good at, something you're passionate about, something you can get paid for, and something the world needs. And Ikigai translates into like purpose. And that's, and that's what this is. It's not a job. I don't get tired of doing it. I don't know when I'm doing it and when I'm not doing it. I'm just always kind of, doing it uh it's just a it's just a part of me now and that's why when you said you know where do you want to be in five years i'm like hopefully still doing this because boy it would be upsetting <laughs> if i had to go work for someone else telling stories like a like a storyteller for hire mercenary of sorts i don't want to do that again i can appreciate that i i came from um I've got a, I do, you know, we do a little bit of fitness consulting, but I came from a long line of oil field consulting, being away from the family for a long, long period of time. Right. Well, the pay was good. The, the work was not rewarding. Um, and it's, it's cool to, uh, you know, to have the opportunity to do something you love, which I do every day, both with my other business and of course, 
uh, with getting a chance to talk to people like you. Before, I'm going to ask you like a few kind of, you know, questions about, about you. But before we do that, is there anything else you wanted to talk about in the roadmap? I know you guys released a roadmap. I'll link to that as well. A Medium post, anything else that you kind of wanted to mention or explore here before we move on? Um, we are, we're, there are actually, there are a lot of projects now. So, you know, one, one of the things that we like to do is we, we want to build simple, scalable solutions. We want to build, we want to, something that takes the the least amount of resources that has the greatest amount of impact. And that doesn't mean like not try, right? That doesn't mean like half-ass something, but it just means like you have so many cycles in a day, you have so much money to burn and you, you know, you have so many people that are available. So what can you do to maximize all of that? Uh, and we have, you know, as, as we go, we're, we're so as much as we can dialed in to, to what's happening that we're like, Oh, there's a gap. Oh, that, okay. I need this tool. This doesn't exist. So there are things that we're finding, you know, we write the roadmap because we want to give the token holders a general idea of where we're going. And then when we get there, we want to say, we did what we said we were going to do. You can, when we say we're going to do it, we're, we're going to do it. But there are so many things that come up in the middle that we're like, let's, let's do this. So for example, you know, EOS snapshots, I mean, I saw a dap after dap after dap. It's like, I'm going to use the Genesis snapshot. And that's fine. You're a developer. You can do whatever you want. This is a free network. But I said, well, there are new people. There, there are new people buying EOS. And they're missing out. And people have sold their stake. And now they're going to get rewarded with more tokens. It's like, this doesn't make any sense. Where is there a snapshot tool? Oh, my God. There isn't one. So we, we, we built one in two weeks. And, and, and that was like, we stopped everything so we could build that. And so we're, we're doing that with a lot of other things too. I just can't talk about a lot of them because uh, we want to make sure that it's ready. before We want to make sure we can do it <laughs> before, uh, before we talk about it. But uh, yeah, check out the roadmap. Uh, the hardware wallet's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm, that. I'm looking forward to it too. I really am. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to kind of give you a few rapid fire questions and then I'm going to set you on your way because I'm sure you're a busy man, but I, I kind of came up with a few of them and one, I don't even really want to ask you because I think I have a really good grasp on it. And that question was, um, if an unknown uncle left you more money than you knew what to do with, what would you be doing right now? And I honestly, I believe based on your answers, you'd be here doing this. Yeah. I would, but I would also build a squash court. And I would be playing squash at, like, so it, when in my free time, which would be never playing squash, but it would be really cool if I could build it in this, like there's a parking lot down the street and I could just buy the parking lot and build a squash court and just hope that everybody kind of respects it. And then just say like, all right, everybody that lives here, I'm going to introduce you to squash. That's and then, and then on the squash court, we can talk about EOS or something like that. I'll have a, we'll have a, a local squash league. I love, it's a racket sport. For anyone who doesn't know what it is, it's like a stupid racket sport that I can't get enough of uh, and I played in college. So that's what I'd be doing besides working on EOS. Yeah, I, I saw that actually. I creeped your LinkedIn too. I played some squash. I played a lot of things. Like um, All right. Yeah, I played some squash. Um, I love squash. And I also saw that you kind of did some volunteer work with that uh, when you were younger with kind of some inner, inner street city use, which I thought was pretty noble. So let's talk about alignment of incentives, right? So this is a perfect, perfect example. Um, I didn't do that because it was the right thing to do. I didn't do that. So what you're, what you're referencing is, uh, for anybody listening, for everybody playing at home, uh, it was a, uh, a program for inner city kids to come learn how to play squash. And what ultimately happened with a lot of these kids is they went on to private high schools with full scholarships and they went and played in college. And like, this is a huge thing. So there would be these multi-million dollar facilities that are uh, in some not so great places in Philadelphia. Um, and, uh, and, and also um, in New York. So I start, I actually, I did start out cause like this was a good thing to do. Like I just wanted to play with kids. And then eventually it came to a point when I had graduated, I still kept doing it. Yes, because it was, a, it was a good thing, but also because it was free court time playing with like 
like kids who were savants in squash. So I'm playing with these, I'm, get, I'm basically getting free lessons, <laughs> but, but it's also doing a very good thing. So, you know, the selfish incentives there were aligned with what the good thing was. And that's what we're doing here in EOS. So it's a, it's actually a good example. I didn't think of that till you brought it up. The perfect analogy. I love it. <laughs> I love it. All right. We're going to go off the few more rapid fire and I'm going to let you do your thing. Okay. Uh, all right, so next one is favorite book or something that you would recommend that everybody should read. Dune. Dune. Lately. Dune. Lately. Oh, my God. This guy. So, actually, I read, I read Ready Player One. Yeah. Uh, I read it a little while ago, and then I read Dune. And it made me feel bad for the author of Ready Player One because it was a cool story, but it was his first book. And Dune and and, and – darn author's name is escaping me now but the the way that he writes you are you have you have lost yourself in another dimension it is the most vivid it's actually amazing because the actual passage of time relative to the number of pages that you are reading is is so huge the disparity between the two you've gone 50 pages and you've moved forward 2 hours but he's so vividly describing every movement every twitch of the muscle in a, in a knife fight in dune or the facial expression so the so dune if anybody hasn't read it you got to read it you got to read them all and then um i would say uh ender's game yes. and uh, ender's game is yes. like the most the coolest it's it's like mind-altering drugs for books i mean it just opens your it, the, that book opened my brain that whole series I did. I read every single one. It's funny you should say Ender's Game. I loved that. I, some of the later books weren't as good because they moved, you know, like the original Ender's Game was, was freaking incredible. And just, just to recap, Dune, you're talking about like back when they made the video game. This is the book version of that. Yeah, Dune, uh, Dune Messiah. It's Paul Atreides. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, the, it's the Arrakis and the Spice and, you know, it's just the right – I don't want to say anything that would spoil it, but it's a fantastic book. It's it's long, but you're just like, yeah, through it. I played the game lots when I was younger. I just never picked up the book. I will do so. I have to agree with you on the Ender's Game and that series too. Awesome. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Recommend. Um, okay. Best purchase you have ever made for under five hundred bucks. <sighs> I would say my wedding ring. Nice. That's fair. I, my wedding ring. It's awesome. And, uh, it, might, it might have actually been free. Because <laughs> you, 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 you get a diamond and they're just like, yeah, just take this thing. It's fine. Do you know how much you just pay me for the diamond? Take the, take the gold. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Well, favorite place to travel that you've ever been in the world? Uh, I, I, I went to Napa Valley. Um, but that wasn't the coolest place. The Galapagos Islands. I, w I had the uh, I had the very fortunate um, opportunity to experience them when I was younger, uh, and that is a you don't I don't know populated with so much wildlife. You don't really get to go. You don't get to go to so many places that are populated with so much wildlife and also completely untouched by man. It's bizarre. Uh, and they don't let you. I mean, you can't even like you can't take it. You can't take a piss on the island. You got to go back. You got to go back on the boat. They don't. They don't want to. They don't want to disrupt anything. But that was wild. Um, a sh uh, I was snorkeling and a shark, a shark bashed the side of my goggles, and ripped into like. A, a, a squid, an octopus. I, I don't even know what it, I didn't even see it. And then there was ink everywhere and I like ran ashore, but it was a very cool thing. I'll never forget it. Yeah. It's that's next on my list. It's actually pretty close here to Costa Rica. Um, and of course being a, I was a diver as a commercial diver, did underwater construction for a while. So it's on my, wow. I gotta make it out there. man. I, um, I want it. I, I want to go. I can totally understand it's top priority. Man, we should do we should do a podcast where I interview you on underwater construction because that the engineering of that stuff is like mind blowing. Yeah. How do you how do you how do you build a tunnel? I don't know. It's how do you build a tunnel and not have it flood all the time? It's not a lot of fun, man. 
<laughs> it's really not. It's like being an underwater laborer who, um, yeah, we won't get into it, but it's, it's not all, I thought I'd be like diving for treasure and like all sorts of cool like explosions to break suction. And, uh, and I found myself scraping needles off of trash racks and sewage treatment plants, but we won't go there. <laughs> it's, a more, it's a lot more glorious than it sounds. I guess um, the last thing, the last thing that I want to ask you before I send you on your way is how do you kind of, in a perfect world, how do you want to be remembered by the community? How do you want to be remembered by your peers? Um, and then is there any last thing you want to talk about? I'll make sure that I list all the resources to everything we talked about today in the video. Uh, I have actually never thought of that. Um, maybe that I helped. I mean, there's a lot, there are a lot of people doing a lot of things. If I'm remembered at all, that's kind of cool. You know, I, but, I don't know. <laughs> That's fair. You're just going to go out there and try to do your thing and, and hope to leave a legacy. And I think you're already doing that. So I'll make sure I link to everything below. Um, Kevin, it's a pleasure. You're a great guy. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure sitting down and having a chat with you and hopefully we can do it again in the future and um, encourage everybody to go and explore and check out EOS New York and um, make sure they give you guys a vote as well, because I think you guys are doing a heck of a job and, um, Thank you. One, one thing is a suggestion for the video when you post it is uh, you should have a note of when the explanation of the dispute resolution stuff starts and when it ends so that people could just skip it if they're not <laughs> interested in it. I think more people are interested than you give credit for. And I think, uh, I think that it was entertaining enough to, uh, to drag people into it. Like, let's get real here, man. These are important conversations. And if you are an EOS holder, if you are in the EOS ecosystem, these are things that, um, even if you don't necessarily have a resolution for it, you've got to be aware of it because it affects everybody. So I'm hoping that nobody will skip that section because I think it's just as important as you. So uh, we, need, we need to welcome businesses on chain. I agree. I absolutely agree. Kevin, it's been a pleasure and uh, I look forward to chatting with you again and I look forward to seeing you around the space. So thank you so much for talking to me and uh, have a great day and stay in touch. Thank you very much for having me. That was a blast. I hope we can do it again soon. We will for sure. I'll see you soon, Kevin. Have a great day. Bye. Ciao.